Welcome. My name is Catherine Antley. I'm a physician in South Burlington, and we're here in uh, the old north end of Burlington in a park because it's COVID. And we're doing the next episode after a long hiatus of the science of effective prevention. Today I have a very special guest with me, Ann Hassel, who is a former bud tender in the cannabis industry, former proponent of selling cannabis commercially, also a physical therapist, and she's up to share, up, to, up from Massachusetts to Vermont to share some of her insights. I'd like to start with a, an intro about um, just some general words about prevention. The science of effective prevention depends on a foundation of science. So first we need good scientists to give us data. That data then needs to be communicated both to the public, to caregivers who are in touch with children and in the community, um, and then that needs to be communicated to legislators who make laws, uh, affect policy, uh, leaders throughout the, the, the state. And in Vermont, we have a fantastic group of really um, brave, uh, courageous, um, highly intelligent, um, recognized um, physicians uh, who, and, and, uh, and other professionals who understand what um, the implications of, of some of the policies that are happening in Vermont. So today we're talking about the commercialization of marijuana and what sorts of you know, guard rails to the public health that we need to put in place. So. Um, there's two things that we want to be sure to touch on, and I'll just mention them first before I jump in. One is, in the legislature right now, they're changing the law. In the past, we had a limit of 60% THC and 30%, which is a little bit like a speed limit of 200 on the, on the, um, on the highway. But it was the first in the nation. America, uh, Vermont's been first in the nation for a lot of things, and this is first in the nation. Very good, very commendable. Right now, they're considering lifting that, creating a loophole for increased THC levels if they're used in, in creating cakes and candies or other products. So we think the public should know about that. And if you, don't, if you disagree with that, perhaps call your legislator, your House member, and let them know. The other thing that, that has happened is when this bill first passed the legislature, many of people in Vermont contacted their legislature and said, we don't want advertising. We don't want it in the newspapers. We don't want it on the radio. We don't want, we don't want the industry to be using advertising to create more addiction because, as we know, more addiction is what creates profit in this industry. And the first law that passed had no advertising. Now they're adding advertising. So if you disagree with that, it's also a reason to definitely contact your legislator and tell them you don't want advertising in the bill. So we have good precedent for that. In 1964, when physicians and scientists finally linked smoking to cancer, there was public outcry. And as a result, we had warning labels that were attached to tobacco. Advertising eventually was banned on broadcast media. And an annual review and report was ordered by the Committee on the Health Consequences of Smoking. All things we need and have good legal precedent for putting into Vermont law. So I, um, I'm going to start with, or continue, I guess, um, just want to talk for a minute about Media Matters. Um, we have fantastic scientists in Vermont. They're communicating to the legislators. They're doing great uh, scientific research. Um, and the legislators understand that there are health risks to cannabis. How do we know that? Number one, the industry admits that it causes, for example, psychosis. We, and we'll go into that more in a minute. Um, but the lawmakers have also understood that cannabis causes psychosis. They put it in the law. So there's a part of the Vermont law that has the word psychosis, and it's uh, put um, um, it, um, some stipulations um, that is supposed to mitigate that. So why would they put that? So here is some of the testimony that has happened. Um, from a medical doctor in the legislature. This is what your legislator is hearing, and we think that Vermonters want to know this information as well. I spent last weekend on call in the ER department, talking to kids, talking to adults, 
And I've observed over my time on call that a significant portion of young people who are hospitalized psychiatrically or come to the ED are heavy cannabis, cannabis users. And we also know that the cannabis that is used today has high THC, nowhere near what is used was used in the 60s. And the research is that there is a significant psychiatric risk for a whole host of problems, most notably psychosis, but I think also suicide and aggression. It is becoming increasingly recognized at the same time, what, so why, why this is becoming increasingly recognized by scientists and physicians, at the same time, the public perception of cannabis is going exactly the opposite way. So I really hope that people will pay attention to this. And because it could really impose a really large burden on our mental health and substance abuse treatment system moving forward. So this is testimony from one of the leading physicians in our state, not me, um, to our legislators. And in response, in partly in response, um, it's in the law, and I'll quote the Vermont, the Vermont law says, on or before January 15, 2020, the executive director of the Cannabis Control Board shall, shall submit to the General Assembly recommendations as to whether different things should be associated with cannabis in order to decrease the possibility that, uh, sorry, to increase, decrease the prevention, to prevent, sorry, um, cannabis-induced psychosis that can occur. So the legislators heard the doctor and they put this into the law. What? Actually, I'd like to interject here, if I may, Dr. Antley. In Massachusetts, we had legalization before Vermont, and in order to supposedly safely regulate it, the Department of Public Health was supposed to, it was issued by our laws in Massachusetts, they were supposed to conduct research and determine what a safe level of THC was to have in a product, and that was never done. So. I, when I hear something like that, and for what I understand, is that's not enforceable. I don't know if you got to that part where they're already changing what was presented to the people, and they're making these assurances. But what happens is the industry is so powerful that it prevents those, I guess, guardrails to preserve and protect public health. And that's been documented in various states. Yeah, the only other thing, I'm, and then I'm going to... Anne's going to um, do the second half of the program almost entirely herself. But the only other thing I wanted to bring up before we leave this, um, this portion is that, you know, why is it that that physician is recognizing that while physicians, providers, all recognize that this is a serious concern and contributing to psychiatric illness in our, in our kids and teens, why is it that the public is not aware of this. And so we pulled an article from just last week from the VT Digger, and it's, the headline is, A Crisis. Kids Seeking Mental Health Care Are Waiting Days in the Emergency Room. This isn't the only article. It's been in three other papers. It's been on the news. This is a crisis in Vermont. In this article, nowhere is cannabis mentioned. So physicians realize that cannabis is a significant contributing factor, but in our articles that are coming down out of our respected news organizations, the, the, the public is not being informed. So this is, is broken. This is a broken chain, and this is a foundation of effective prevention. We must have good scientists, and that information must be communicated not only to policymakers as it is, but also to the public. So I'm going to turn it over to Anne, and Anne is, has worked for the cannabis industry in Vermont, I mean in uh, Massachusetts, and has enormous um, experience with that whole situation. Well, as Dr. Anthony said, I went into the industry. I was someone who believed in marijuana as being natural, healthy, and non-addicting. However, I discovered that that is not true. I'm not the only one who's made these actual uh, who's had a change of heart. In addition, I started consuming the flour, which was 30% THC. That went later to the concentrates that was 98% THC. And consuming that via dabbing, which is when you take a small amount of the concentrate with a butane torch and a glass rig like a bong, when I started consuming that, I had, I had severe mental problems that escalated. I developed a cannabis use disorder. I also started to experience cannabis-induced psychosis. Now, it's been proven, the literature's there, the science is there, that 
cannabis is a factor in psychosis. There's something called cannabis-induced psychosis. And it's really upsetting that states such as Vermont, following Colorado, following Massachusetts, are falling in the same pitfall. And I just want to talk about someone else. So in terms of my terrible psychological effects is that I started to, again, have a cannabis addiction, consuming more and more. I had these escalating violent thoughts that I wanted to harm people. First it was property, then it was killing people, escalating. And then at that point, I just wanted to kill myself. And that's where I was at the point of only having cannabis in my body, and that was bringing me to the point of suicide. So when, doc when the doctor mentions that it may cause aggression, that it causes suicidal thoughts, well, that actually is true. I experienced it. I'm not the only one. There's a, a very big Colorado cannabis proponent, Robert Corey, had a change of heart. He himself experienced some very detrimental effects of, he was actually dabbing also. And he actually came to understand that what he strove to enact, the cannabis industry, the commercialized industry, was dangerous. He said flat out that, he's a, that he is, uh, the outcome of the legalization of Colorado is shameful, hurts people, and Colorado is not safer. And he goes on, like me, we went into it thinking it would be about so-called healthy plant. It's about creating, I would say, the most dangerous, disgusting product imaginable. And as you increase the level of potency, you're increasing the addiction and the mental harm. There was also another individual. He came before Robert Corey. He was also a cannabis site reviewer called The Gentleman Toker was the name of the site. And also, Joe Tierney, he was dabbing. He noticed that he was coughing up blood, and he decided to quit dabbing. The thing is, what's going on here? People are being told that cannabis is a safe medicine, when that's the absolute opposite of what's happening. And I feel really bad for the young people, because I was a middle-aged woman with a fully developed frontal lobe with no access to weapons. What would have happened? If I was younger, would I have developed schizophrenia, uh, Dr. Ainsley? That's my question, is that there is a connection. Maybe you can talk about the connection of when you are in cannabis due to psychosis, how many then go into um, schizophrenia? So we have a number of, um, so when, um, there, there, there's a number, I guess we'll just address it. There are a number of people who say this is association, it's not causality. And what is the evidence that we have that cannabis causes psychosis? It's very strong. Um, and just as an example, uh, you can't take a group of t kindergartners, a class of kindergartners, and divide them into two, and then give one THC or give one tobacco, and watch them over 45 years or 60 years, and see which, one, which group develops more cancer. That's unethical. We can't do that. This is the reason that we rely on these other um, studies to support um, and come to the conclusion, which we have, that tobacco causes cancer. So the same types of studies that we came to the conclusion that tobacco causes cancer are the same sorts of studies that we're now coming to the conclusion that cannabis is a component cause of psychosis. And as Robin Murray says, no serious scientist continues to dispute that cannabis is a component cause of, of psychosis. And what is the evidence? I mean, some of the evidence we can run through the more potent product you use, the more likely you are to become psychotic. The more often you use it, the younger you use it, the, the more likely you are to have a psychotic break. Nearly 50%, this is important for people to know, I think, 50, almost 50% 50 of people who have a full-blown psychotic event on, on cannabis will go on to schizophrenia. And, and if your child or if your husband or or lover or, or friend has had a serious psychotic break on marijuana, they emphatically should never be using cannabis again because if they do, they're at 50% risk of developing schizophrenia, which is a life, dis, you know, qual the quality of life is, 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 is ne nearly completely destroyed. It's very difficult to treat it with antipsychotics. It's very difficult to stop using, very difficult to treat the addiction. Um, so that's why in this particular array, prevention is the most important part. So why is it so devastating? People hear voices, they see, uh, they see hallucinations, they have uh, paranoid delusions. Um, and so th there's one other um, factor that has happened even with, with researching cannabis, and that is if you give uh, two groups of people who are 
they have the same amount of childhood trauma and age and sex and and all the other adverse. They're, in other words, they're they're controlled groups. Um, and you double blind them, and you give one group placebo, and you give the other group THC. The THC elicits psychosis. That's one of the in a prospective double blind study. That's a very powerful study um, to support the idea that cannabis causes psychosis. So that's, that's a summary of where we are. I think it's important now, if people don't want the legislature to put in the um, loophole for the high THC, call your representative. If you don't want advertising, uh, broadcast media, um, in the newspapers, or uh, call, call your representative absolutely right now, because this is important. Um, this is not about, you know, um, that advertising and high THC is not about civil justice or social justice. Um, it's, it, it works against public health. Um, and so uh, I, I think that there's every reason to, to make your voice heard. And I guess we'll finish. In Massachusetts, they put these things in the law, but they weren't able to um, enforce them or get them to actually um, be part of what people experience in the law. And that's um, got to do with the... The, 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 the requirement was given to the Cannabis Control Board, and the Cannabis Control Board is controlled basically by the governor. If the governor doesn't have control over the Cannabis Control Board to make sure these things happen, then they don't happen, or they might not happen. And that's the situation, the same situation we had in Massachusetts where it didn't happen. We have the setup, apparently, in Vermont where we don't have the ability to make sure these things that are written into the law do happen. Well, you mentioned advertising. In Massachusetts, advertising is not allowed if uh, the audience, if there's an audience of 15% of people under 21, but there'll be a bus stop that has a huge marijuana advertising right at the children's bus stop, and nothing is done about that. And as for the Cannabis Control Commission, what I've observed in my state over the past couple of years is that people are on board for a little while, and then they go to work in the industry. <laughs> so where are their priorities? Crony what, capitalism. It's crony called, um, <laughs> actually, Robert Corey called it crony uh, capitalism. Cr crony, and, ca um, crony, uh, crony cannabis. Uh, cannabis cronyism. Oh, yeah. He called it cannabis crony. Listen to this part. This also is how I feel. What I have changed my mind on, applying current reality, I was too naive to anticipate 10 years ago, is the wisdom of a commercialized, for-profit, elitist, government-protected, privileged, monopolistic industry that perpetuates itself and its obscene profits to the detriment of the public good and the planet Earth. Well, I think he summed it up pretty well. That's a great place to end this program. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Anne, for coming down from Massachusetts. You're welcome. That's an awesome quote. and. You know, I, I hope that you've, you've enjoyed tuning in today, and we'll see you next time on the Science of Effective Prevention.